I would like to start the conversation, Richard, by asking you about the basics. So let me start with what is nudging. A nudge is any small feature of the environment that attracts our attention and uh, alters our behavior. And uh, it does so without requiring anyone to do anything and without economic incentives. So the rational economic actors and economic models would not be affected by nudges, but humans are. Can you give us a couple of examples? Sure. You know, we all use nudges all the time in our daily life. We set an alarm to wake us up in the morning. We don't have to set an alarm. We don't have to get up. It's just a nudge. Uh, we have a calendar invite to remind us that we have a webinar at seven o'clock my time. Um, we put money aside uh, into an account that we label retirement money. All of these are nudges that we do to ourselves and uh, other people are nudging us all the time for good or for bad. Can you clarify a bit the difference between a um, nudge and how it's different to a shove or a push? Sure. Uh, we define a nudge as something you can opt out of almost costlessly. Ideally, one click. So... Pushes and shoves are harder to evade. So if somebody is pushing you, you know, you have to lean in to avoid being pushed. Our ideal, our, our ideal of nudging is uh, GPS. Both of us, Cass and I, have terrible sense of direction. And we get lost all the time, or we used to. And now, you know, you turn on Google Maps and... You decide where you want to go, and it makes a suggestion. If you see something else you want to go to, never complains. It's perfect. So our ideal life would be one in which everything you have to do in life is as easy as following the GPS directions from home to work. Nudging is kind of closely related to, idea, to the idea of, of choice architecture. And choice architecture is kind of a set of ideas you brought over from design, from human design literature. How, how should we think about choice architecture? Choice architecture is just the environment in which we choose. So uh, think about the Amazon storefront, which of course is just a web page. Now, they have essentially every book in print anywhere and some that are out of print. If you went into a physical store that had that, you would run away. It, it would just be horrible. And you could certainly never find anything. How would they have it organized? Now, a small bookstore, you know, can be fiction, nonfiction, a whole section devoted to nudge, presumably. Um, but the, the reason why Amazon or Netflix um, can operate on the scale they do is they have good choice architecture, meaning people can find what they want. And we encounter choice architecture everywhere. If we go to a restaurant, Someone has decided what food will be cooked. Someone else has decided how to write that down in a menu, how to group things, how to order things. And to a first approximation, everything matters. So choice architecture and nudging are in some way inevitable, everything. Yeah, there are, you know, some of our critics have said over the years, well, you shouldn't be nudging that's none of your business. Um, and they are living in a world that doesn't exist. It's a world in which there's a neutral way to do things. And there, it, there is no, imagine a bookstore. Uh, they have to arrange the books on shelves. 
You have to do it somehow. And random wouldn't be a good way. So there are lots of different ways to do it. And they nudge you to buy some books by putting them in piles in the front. That's nudging. And, uh, but there's no neutral way to do it. So even, even active choice is in some ways a choice architecture. Absolutely. And, you know, we don't always want active choice. So, you know, how many times do you say uh, to your partner uh, or your partner says, what do you want to watch tonight? You say, I don't care. You pick. Right? Uh, and you can get into a fight. No, you pick. No, you pick. So th there are times where we just want somebody to pick. And some of the best restaurants in the world that I've ever been to have no choice. You go in, you know, the best way to eat at a jo Japanese restaurant is omakase. That means the chef let, picks. Let the chef you, pick for you. You, <laughs> you eat. Nothing's better than that. You can tell them if you're allergic to something. But that's... Um, Anyway, yeah, we can't get around choice architecture any more than we can have a neutral architecture. If you design a building, it has to have doors. It has to have stairs and elevators and bathrooms. And where you situate those things will affect how the building works. What's the most important principle of choice architecture? Well, I think it's to make it easy for people to achieve their goals. Dan in his introduction mentioned that governments around the world have created so-called nudge units. I was involved in the first one that David Cameron formed in, in Britain in 2010. <clears throat> and I would go around on some of the early meetings and it became, my mantra and the group's mantra, if you want people to do something, make it easy. So, you know, the GPS wants me to follow the map, make it as obvious as possible which way it wants me to go. And that's the most important principle in, in any aspect of life, business or government. We'll come back to making it um, too easy a little bit later <laughs> on. <laughs> but um, before that, I, I, I want to take you a bit to this idea of, of kind of unlearning homo economicus. So I want to reflect for, for a second on just how big a departure, the premise of what we've just talked about, nudge and, and choice architecture and behavioral economics is from, from mainstream economic theory. And the core premise of economics is that people choose by, by optimizing and that people are rational and respond to incentive. And this model has, has dominated uh, economics and has an incredible influence still. And for the last four, four decades, um, you've, your work has shown how people depart from these fictional creatures in, in economic models. And you've, co you've coined econs and humans in, in the first uh, in the first nudged book, but it goes back to observations you've, you've made in, in, in grad school. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. So, you know, much like Dan was describing his experience in graduate school, I kept saying, where are these people? So as you put it, well, e economic theory is based on a theory of optimization that agents, they're not called people. It's amusing that um, people are missing from economic theory and even the word doesn't appear. You talk, they talk about agents and agents can be consumers, they could be producers, they could be, the people are factors of production. Does that sound like humans? So these agents solve, you give them a problem, find the best job because you've been laid off, they solve. So they pick the best one, choose the best mortgage. They look at all the mortgages that they qualify for, they pick the best one. And calculating all the things that could possibly happen to them over the course of the mortgage. This is preposterous. 
I don't know any economist who can do that. So why does that exist? It's because economists are not that smart. And I don't mean that as an insult. The easiest problems to write down formally are ones that you write down max. Because anybody who's had high school calculus knows how to solve, find the maximum of some function, you take a derivative, set it equal to zero, check the second order conditions, right? If describing behavior of wandering through the supermarket, picking the things that you vaguely remember you were supposed to be there to buy and not paying any attention to things on sale or things that look good or ice cream, yum. Uh, That's hard to model. And uh, so economists took the easy way out. It wasn't always that way. Adam Smith, people think of Adam Smith as Mr. Laissez-faire, leave everything alone. Um, But he talked about very modern concepts like overconfidence and loss aversion. It's all in Adam Smith. I just rediscovered it. Now, I must say, though, economists um, never have to start a book then by explaining homo economicus, yet it's quite obvious that people suffer from, you know, the problems you've just described, self-control, chocolate, and all the kinds of emotions that that affect their behavior. Um, Humans still have to be the first chapter in in every one of your books and in every behavioral economics book. Um, And for all the the, the tremendous success that Notch has, has had, Homo economicus is still the dominant species. And then your work building on, on obviously on Kahneman and, and Tversky's work um, was first a nuisance, then, then it came to be kind of tolerated, if not outright accepted. Um, what's been your experience over the years trying to change people's minds? Why is it so hard to change economists and policy pe- policymakers' minds? Yeah, you know, I... I often say I don't think I changed anyone's mind. I've been at this for 40 years. I'm not aware of any economist who changed their mind about this stuff. So how have I and my colleagues succeeded? The strategy was corrupt the youth. Now, some like Dan didn't need that much corrupting, but we... I said, look, it's not going to work to try and convince Gary Becker or Bob Lucas or Gene Fama, uh, my Chicago colleagues who are famous adherents to the rational model. I'm going to try to get graduate students interested in this. And Danny Kahneman and I, uh, with another colleague of ours, Colin Kammerer, started a tradition in 1994 of having a summer camp, two two weeks for the best graduate students from around the world. And most of the great behavioral economists working today are graduates of that summer camp. And it's now being taught and has been taught for a decade or more by two people who were at the first one as students David Leibson and Matthew Raven. How do we get ordinary people to change their minds? I mean, I, I, take, I take your point about, about economists, you know, it's really difficult to change their mind on something they've worked on their entire lives. But how, how do we collectively kind of unlearn homo economicus as the exception oh, than the rule? I, I think the rest of the world finds homo economicus just to be rather amusing. And Now, it's true that economists have undue weight. I said once that in the US, the government is run by lawyers who occasionally listen to economists. And I don't know how it is down under, but uh, economists have a lot of influence and pretty much run things like the central bank. Um, And there's a council of economic advisors there's no council of psychological advisors and or anything, any other kind of advisors. There's not even a council of 
scientific advisors. There is an office that's more or less that. But uh, economists have great sway and uh, they have traditionally adhered to the standard model, but that's, that's changing. And um, certainly the economists in the Obama administration and in the Biden administration were, if not flag carrying behavioral economists, they were uh, certainly friendly converts. <laughs>